attending swell the triumph of his name hallelujah hallelujah god appears on earth to reign every eye shall
welcome to Netley Christian Fellowship. Uh, whether you're here at Abbey Hall or you're joining us online, we pray that God will meet with us, will bless us, uh, challenge us and encourage us in our Christian walk. The notices can be found on our website and uh, especially draw your attention to those today. There's a really good interview with Tom and Rachel about their upcoming wedding as part of our Not Just Sundays series and we'll be praying about that uh, later in the day when we meet at six o'clock for our evening service. There's a midweek meeting, it's the whole church Bible study and prayer meeting this week which will be on Zoom and details again can be found in the notice sheet. Well, we're going to start our, our worship as we sing or we hear a great uh, hymn of, of praise, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. We'll stand in the hall as we, we hear this. <laughs>
to join in. It won't be long before we can. Uh, I was singing inwardly at the top of my voice, and I was still coming in at the wrong point in that fifth line. We'll uh, take our catechism question uh, now, which is number 10 in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which asks the question, how did God create man? And the answer is, God created man, male and female, after his own image, in knowledge, righteousness and holiness, with dominion over the creatures. I love the account, the narrative of creation. As we go through the various days of creation, we see God filling his creation with living creatures. And he talks about sea creatures and beasts of the earth and livestock and creeping things. And after each one of these parts of his creation he's made, God says he made them after their own kind. So they belong to a, a set. He makes cows, and within their DNA, they have the ability to be brown cows and Frisian cows and highland cattle, but they are all always cows. And he makes dogs, and within their DNA, they have the ability to be a spaniel chasing a scent for hours and hours, or a Labrador picking up the biggest log that it can find in Eden and wandering around with it, or, or whatever. All of them are after their own kind, though. But then he comes to human beings, and God says something different at this point. God says, now let us make man, human beings, after our own image, in our image. He, he makes males and females in the image of God. In other words, to be a bit like God, to reflect the character of God. They're different to the rest of creation, the catechism question says. He, he makes them in the image of God with knowledge, incredible knowledge that we have that even the most intelligent creatures don't have. He makes us with righteousness. In other words, we, we are moral beings. We know what's right, and we know what's wrong, and, and it matters. We have consciences. And he also makes us after his image in holiness. And that really means to, to belong to God, to be friends with God, our first catechism question was that our, what we were created for was to know God, to enjoy him, and to glorify him forever. So this is absolutely fabulous. And he makes human beings to be like his kings and queens, ruling over the creation that he's made. In his image, with dominion over everything. And, and then... Whilst this was all very good, tragically, something went wrong. A man sinned against God, and that image of God that is in us was marred and scarred and defiled, and the curse came, and everything was now put out of joint because of sin. I've got a picture, which is a picture of the most famous painting in the whole world. I don't know whether any of you children know what this painting is, if you can see it. It's the Moaning Lisa, or the Mona Lisa, painted by Leonardo da Vinci. And it's, it's not just the most famous painting in the world, it's the most valuable painting in the world. It was insured by an insurance company back in the 1960s for $100 million. That was in the 60s. Now, that means today that's probably would be insured for around a billion dollars. And it hangs in Paris, in the Louvre, behind bulletproof glass. And the reason that it's behind bulletproof glass is that in the past, people have tried to attack it, and it's been defaced once or twice. Yeah. Uh, that, that's not actually a picture of what happened in the past. Uh, we couldn't find a picture, but Chaz has found me one of the Corona Lisa, apparently. <laughs> but what had happened is that somebody came with acid 
and threw acid over the painting to try to destroy it. I don't know why. Why did you do that? Or another person came with a hammer and tried to attack the painting in order to destroy it, to deface the image of the Mona Lisa. And what happened after those attacks is that it very carefully, very skillfully, a very expensive process, experts had to restore the image of the Mona Lisa. Well, whilst that's a, a priceless painting, I get the joy of telling you as a, a boy or a girl, man or woman made in the image of God, you are priceless to God. You are beyond value to God. And the story of the Bible is that how God will come and he will overturn this curse and he's going to restore the true image of God into our lives. And it's the story that we see Sunday by Sunday. We could never get away from this and we never will get away from this. It's the story that centers on Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, who the Bible tells us is the image of the invisible God. He is everything that man was supposed to be. And he comes into this world, and then his, his image gets marred, not because of his sin, but because of his suffering for our sin, as he gives himself to the cross in order to pay for everything that we've done wrong, and to sweep it all away, and to forgive us, and then to send the Holy Spirit, who was mighty and powerful in the work of the first creation, into our hearts to now restore the image of God in us. That's where the Bible's taking us, Romans 8, to be conformed to the image of the Son of God. And we, we look forward to that day when we will be what God intended us to be, with Jesus now reigning over a perfect creation, a beautiful Eden restored. This is what a story of hope this is. The poor people who don't know Jesus, they just think the world's going on and on, it's getting worse and worse. One day it'll just it'll all be gone, extinguished. But that's not right. God's told us that we get to the end and everything he makes new again. Well, let's come to part of God's great story to us in Exodus chapter 3 as we, we come to hear God's word. Now, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. He said, but I will be with you. 
And this shall be the sign for you that I've sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. <clears throat> and God said to, Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt, and I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord... The God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now, please, let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and I will strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and, your, and on your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. May God bless to us his word. And we're going to come before him in prayer. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we come into your presence and we thank you that we are not left grasping into the darkness in our ignorance as we seek you because you're a God who has spoken, you're a God who has revealed yourself in your word and in your name. You've told us that you are the one who is known as I am, I am who I am. You are the self-existent, eternal, dependent upon no one God, the God who is unchanging and unchangeable. We thank you that you come to us in increasing revelation, that you don't narrow the revelation of yourself down, that it becomes smaller, but you, you expand it as we go through the pages of Scripture till finally we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who could say, I am the good shepherd and I am the way, the truth and the life and I am the bread of life and I am the light of the world and suddenly in Jesus you've met us face to face and that you've met us in a way which doesn't overwhelm us or leave us uh, destroyed because of your holiness and your glory and the fact that you are the God of fire but you've come to us in a way of gentleness, a way which is full of grace and truth. We praise you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his compassion and his mercy and his understanding and his willingness to meet us where we were that he might lift us up to where we need to be. We praise you for the way in which he set his mind and his eyes firmly upon that cross that was his destiny where he would give his life, the one who is the son of God, for the sinful sons and daughters of men, that we might, by faith, become the sons and the daughters of God. Lord, we rejoice in this incredible gospel, 
that you have given to this world right from the very beginning, right from the fall, promising Adam that you'd send a saviour who would crush Satan's head and who would put all things right. And you've never once deflected from that promise. You've never broken that covenant. And you can't because you are who you are. Give confidence to us to trust you, to hold on to you through all the storms that we go through. Help us to realize that you are the all-sufficient, all-faithful, ever-present God. Just as you said to Moses, I'm coming with you. You've said that to us every day of our lives. We thank you that you're prepared to meet us in all of our points of need and your grace is bigger than our need. And We pray for various needs within the, the church fellowship. We pray for Brian and for Enid and to ask that you would bring healing and comfort to Enid and give strength and joy to Brian. Watch over their family. Uh, we pray, Father, for the plans that we've been thinking about of those who are looking to get married, for Tom and for Rachel, for Joe and Gio, and ask that all the, the cares and the, the worries and the concerns that they might have, they might be able to cast onto you because you surely care for us. We pray that soon the days will be restored to us when we can be all together as church in this hall and we can lift up our voices in praise and we pray that we'll appreciate that in a new way, having had it removed from us for a while. We pray for days when we can sit down and we can break bread and share meals together uh, as, a, as a church and we, we, it's been nearly a year since we were able to do that and Lord we do miss it but we pray that you'll give us patience and uh, grace as we seek to obey the authorities in this land and do it in a way that honours you now speak to us from your word thank you Father that your word is not bound and it's not been restricted in the slightest by this lockdown. It's been doing incredible things in many lives. And we look to you now to take something that many people would think was obscure and old and just show us how living this word is, and how active and powerful it is in the hands of the Holy Spirit. For we come in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll sing our second song, have our second song, which is my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.
You'll be looking at Exodus chapter 3 and the passage that runs from verse 7 to the end of the, the chapter, verse 22. But I'll just read from verse 13. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. We met Moses at the beginning of chapter 3 as an 80-year-old shepherd who's looking after his father-in-law's sheep, uh, following them, leading them through the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula. The last 40 years of his life have been spent in absolute obscurity. He tells us only the scantiest details about what's happened from the age of 40 to the age of 80. He got married to a lady called Zipporah. I learned last week that Zipporah means Twitterer or Tweeter. So I'm forever going to be picturing Zipporah with a Blackberry, because they were probably around still then, on, uh, on social media, firing off uh, acerbic comments onto Pharaoh's account. But what her name means, Tweeter, and they've had a son called Gershom, which means resident, Gershom, alien, because that's what Moses feels that he is. He's going to be a, a permanent exile. And he works for his father-in-law. He's done 40 years of shepherding. He ought to have been looking forward to his long service, gold clock or gold sundial, whatever they gave then, and a comfortable retirement coming up. And then suddenly he meets God. And this 80-year-old man is commissioned into the greatest work of the Old Testament the angel of the Lord, who is God, we saw this last week, he is it's a theophany, an appearance of God, an appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ before he comes into the world as man. And he, he, he meets Moses in this flame of fire burning endlessly in a bush which isn't consumed. It must have been a, an awesome sight. God has visibly broken through into our world, and Moses is summoned, Moses, Moses, and yet at the same time he's told not to come near. Even the ground before God is holy ground, and Moses isn't fit to stand on it. And yet we saw last week that God's desire is not to push Moses away. It's not what he wants in his relationship with any of us. And he makes an Exodus 3 provision for Moses to carry on standing on holy ground. Take your sandals off your feet, he says. It's a very simple thing to do. Moses obeys. He's able to carry on standing in the immediate presence of the God of fire. You and I are not given an Exodus 3 provision, thank goodness, to take our shoes off at the moment. But we're given a perfect provision in the gospel whereby we can come and stand in the presence of God. We come to one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that's where we're going to get to this morning. It won't be difficult to get from Exodus 3 to the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But God not only appears visibly to Moses in this flame of fire, he, he also appears verbally to Moses in his word, in the name that he gives. And this is even more important. And I want to explore this passage asking two questions. And they are, who am I? And you say, but that's one question. Well, no, it's not. It's two questions. Because the first question, who am I, will be asked of God by Moses. Who am I? 
And it's a question that every one of us needs to ask. But the second is really being asked of Moses by God, but who am I? And that's a question every one of us needs to hear and then respond to. So first of all, let's look at Moses' question. Who am I? Verse 9. Now, behold, this is God speaking, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people out of Egypt. For Moses said to God, but who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses might very well have hit his face in fear and awe of God at the end of verse 6, but he most certainly does not hide his fears from God. And what begins here is quite a long tussle with God, a struggle with God that is going to range over the next couple of chapters. It will reach its climax in chapter 5, verse 22, when Moses doing God's work which he's been reluctant to do, seems to have made things ten times worse to start off with. And he turns to the Lord and he said, Oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's done evil to this people, and you've not delivered your people at all. And if Moses at the end of the first encounter with Pharaoh is saying to God, why did you send me? I told you it was a mistake. At the end of the, or the beginning of the first encounter with God, he is saying, who am I that you should send me? I can't do this. Now, in some ways, this is a really encouraging sign in Moses' life. I think the 40-year-old Moses, we looked at a couple of weeks ago, didn't even wait for God's commission, did he? He didn't wait for God's presence. He could do it by himself. He was, as we read in the New Testament at that point, mighty in word and deed. He was mighty in strength. He was at the peak of his powers. And Moses, the 40-year-old, acted alone as if he were God. He saw oppression, and he decided what was going to happen. He acted as the prosecution, he acted as the judge and the jury and the executioner and the undertaker. And his attempt in all of his strength to save the people had been a colossal failure. Moses, as an old man, is still scarred by that memory. And he's been completely emptied of his self-confidence. Now, that's, that's no bad thing, I don't think. In fact, I, I think self-distrust is something which is essential for Christians. To the church that Jesus sends, not to one Pharaoh, but to the whole world, Jesus says, but remember this, without me, you can do nothing. We have to ask ourselves, are we... Are we Christians and a church which is like the 40-year-old Moses, still needing to learn that in our strength, with our gifts and our skills and our energy, without God, we accomplish nothing? Or are we Christians? Are we a church like the 80-year-old Moses, learning in our weakness that God accomplishes all things? And with simple, radical trust in Jesus and his ways and using the tools that he's given us, the word and prayer, carrying on in faith and obedience, we prove then in our weakness that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We were thinking last Sunday evening of what it is to live life humbled under the mighty hand of God and how this is how the Christian is to live life, humbled under God's hand, and then as anxieties and insecurities rise up, we'll be thinking about this this evening, we, we get to hurl these things onto a God who cares for us as a trailer for this evening's service. This is the most exciting verse in the New Testament. 
not the most, it's a most exciting verse in the New Testament. We'll, we'll look at that because people who are humbled under God have these, these anxieties and these fears. We all do. We, we need to do something with them. But you look at Moses here and his self distrust is not accompanied now by trust in the Lord. His insecurities and anxieties seem bigger than the promises of God. And excuse after excuse tumbles out of Moses' mouth. He says, well, I wouldn't know what to say to them. And I wouldn't know how to say it. I'm not an eloquent person. Moses, to me, remember, was mighty in word and deed when he was younger. And he seems extremely eloquent in his arguments with God here. And yet he says, I couldn't possibly speak. I'm not an eloquent person. I'm not equipped. Send someone else. Now, let's not underestimate the, the task that God is calling him to. He is sending him to challenge Pharaoh and Egypt. An old man, an 80-year-old shepherd, is going to take on the great superpower of his day. And historians call Egypt the superpower of superpowers. The greatest superpower that has ever been. It lasted as a superpower for well over a thousand years. Although it would never be the same after God dealt with Pharaoh. And I suppose the equivalent would be God appearing to one of us and saying, right, I want, you to, uh, I want you to get straight over to, to Beijing and I want you to demand an audience with Xi Jinping and all of his officials in the Communist Party and you are to tell him that the Lord says you to stop persecuting the church in China and you're to let my people go otherwise I will trash the Chinese economy. I will wipe out your military might and I will give you, Jing, a date with destiny. I'm not sure any of us would be saying, oh, bring it on. A Pete Booth probably would. But we're not all Pete Booth, are we? Uh, I don't think I'd be saying, well, where's my passport? When do we go? And that's the scale of the task that Moses is called to here. And it didn't particularly go well last time he tried to do this. So here's a man who is brutally honest about himself. I can't do this, which is okay. But he doesn't go on to be honest about what God can do. And, and that's the second question, but who am I? And I love the way that God doesn't dismiss Moses' inadequacies, as we would so often do. Someone comes to us, or perhaps we say, I can't do this. I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm not skillful enough. I'm not well enough equipped. And we respond by saying, of course you are. You're, you're marvelous. You're amazing. Now, they might very well have been extending an invitation for, for praise and reassurance to, to boost a flagging ego. Or it might have been a genuine, heartfelt, desperate cry for help. I really can't do this. And the only answer to those fears is, actually, you're so right. You can't. You can't do this Christian life by yourself. You can't do life by yourself. Let's go to God with this. And Moses isn't given a pep talk here by God when he says, who am I? And God puts his arm, you're wonderful, marvelous. You can do it easy. God doesn't do that at all. But Moses is inadequacies are not the issue here. Of course he isn't able to do this by himself, but God is. And the, the lovely thing is, verse 12, God says, I'm coming too. You're not going by yourself. You're not going to be doing anything by yourself. I am coming too, but I will be with you. We could read that as I am with you. The Lord has never called anyone because of their adequacy. Nor is his presence conditional on our being 
adequate, our being enough by ourselves. Read your Bibles. This God who appears to Gideon when he's hiding in a tank, a pit, and looks over the top and says, Hello, mighty man. Come on out. You're going to deliver Israel. And he's, oh, I can't do this. I'm the smallest person from the smallest tribe and the smallest family. And God says to him, yeah, there's only one problem with you. Your army's too big. It's not Gideon's strength that God is going to use. It's Gideon's weakness. He's a God who is able to speak to a false prophet through a donkey, if he so wishes. God is not dependent upon our adequacy. Nor was the answer to suddenly transform Moses into a superhero. God doesn't say to this trembling man who says, I can't do this. Okay, you can. Boom, there you are, Iron Man. Now standing in the wilderness or an 80-year-old Hulk or whichever superhero you want to have. I think my superhero would be adequate man or almost adequate man. But God meets Moses' inadequacy with his own sufficiency. And he calls Moses to trust and obey. I'm coming with you. I'm all you need. I love the sign that he gives Moses, verse 12. But I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that I've sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Isn't that a strange sign? Because he won't see the sign until, first of all, he's trusted. And he's obeyed. And followed God. For sure, chapter 4, God will give signs in the present to reassure Moses. But this sign is in the future. And it demands faith in the present. But it's God's promise that will say, I told you I was with you when it comes to pass. Every Sunday after the morning service, uh, since lockdown began and we've been able to meet together, we've taken up a sign from Jesus. As we've shared in this little fellowship meal. And that meal anticipates a great day which Jesus has promised. Which is ahead of us. Jesus, remember, said, I won't drink of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it with you in the kingdom of God. A day when we don't meet to worship on a mountain, but we sit down at the feast of feasts with Jesus. And Jesus will say, yeah, there's the sign now. I told you I was with you. I told you we'd all get here. But God gives something even better than a sign. He gives a name. He gives himself. And in response to Moses' question, who shall I say sent me? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say to this people, the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And this becomes the Old Testament name for God. You've read it thousands and thousands of times in your Old Testament. Every time you see the word Lord written in capital letters, you need to almost look beyond the word and and read four Hebrew consonants, Y, H, W, H, which is what God is saying here, Yahweh, I am. And this is the one place in the Old Testament where this name for God, I am, just begins to get unpacked for us in this mysterious enigmatic, marvelous, I am who I am. Yet this isn't designed to confuse us. This is revelation of God in his name. It isn't designed to conceal God, but to to illuminate and to encourage us. We think of that expression, I am who I am, and perhaps we use it as an excuse. You you just have to accept me. I am who I am. It's what I'm like. Sorry about it. I can't help it. Or perhaps we we use it as a a shout of defiance, like Gloria Gaynor did in uh, her 
a hit song of the same name. I am who I am. Don't give a damn what you think. I'll bang my own drum. Some think it's noise. I think it's pretty. Life is a sham until you can say I am who I am. Except she reached a bit more of a crescendo than I was able to. But it's take me as I am. I'm not changing for anyone. But God isn't making an excuse here for who he is. Or shouting out in defiance. God is stooping down to encourage and bless little scared, guilty people like Moses and like us. He takes this form of the verb to be. And what, what he's really saying to us, I think, is that in whatever happens, in every place, at every point of time, in every circumstance, in every need, in the face of all of the impossibilities that you come across, I want you to understand that I am. I am the self-existent, dependent on no one God. You don't invent me. You don't think what I might be able to do. You don't dare limit me. I am who I am. And if he is what he is, and the verb can also be future and will always be what he is, then also he must still be what he was, mustn't he? Which is the all-sufficient, all-faithful, competent, powerful, just, merciful, full of compassion, overflowing with grace, God. God can reveal more of himself in his words and his deeds, which is the story of the unfolding mystery of the Bible, but it will always be more of who he is. I am. God's telling us he can't change into something else. He can't morph into a, a different God. He will always be who he is. So you know where you stand with God who says, I am who I am. I look at the, the chapter. Look at how God has come to us in the pages of Exodus chapter 3. Verse 6, God says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. We skip on to verse 15, and God says, Say to the people, the Lord, which now is capital letters, you know what that means, don't you? It means I am. So, say to the people, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. Verse 16, go to the elders of Israel and say, the Lord, which means I am, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. You're thinking, this is almost tautologous, but it is hammering home to us the fact that I am the God of the covenant. I will always be the God of the covenant. The covenant that I made with Abraham is as unchangeable as I am. He is the God of the past, he's saying. The God of the past promises. The God who was able to untangle and sustain and to lead and save the, the fathers who were equally fragile and, in, and inadequate as Moses was. And God is saying to them, I am the one who has given myself to them because this is possession. I am the God of these people. I belong to them. Now he's saying to Moses, and I give myself in the present to their family of faith. I can't not be what I am, which is the covenant-keeping God. If I was a God who was faithful to Abraham, I have to be faithful to Abraham's family. 
and to all who share Abraham's faith. And so in the present, the God who is I am, who I am, can say, verse 7, look, I've seen, I've heard, I know their sufferings, I've come down to deliver. He says to Moses in verse 12, not only I will be with you, but actually I am with you. He uses the same expression here. Moses hears the covenant name of God almost before it's been announced. So I am as a God who is with you. He's present with his people. He's the God of the future. doesn't change. As we go through the chapter, he can see the opposition of Pharaoh. It doesn't surprise him. It doesn't thwart him. And he says, I'll simply overcome it with my mighty hand because I am the God of all power. And he is the God of justice. I love the way chapter 3 finishes. I'm going to make sure you get paid for all the years of slavery you've done in, in Egypt. You're going to plunder the Egyptians because they haven't paid you for the past best part of 400 years. So there's a big tally to sort out. And God takes care of the little details because I am as a God of justice as well. And he can say, I am the God who finishes what I set out to do. I come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good land. That's a, a promise that Moses will hold on to when after the golden calf incident, God says, right, stand back. I'm going to destroy this people and make a new nation of you. And Moses has got it. He said, ah, God, but your name. You see your name. You can't change. You said to me then you would bring this people not just out but in. And therefore, I plead the covenant. I rest on your name. You have to finish what you've set out to do. Wherever the people of God are, you know. Whether it's in, the, in Egypt in the wilderness, in the Old Testament land, as the church in exile, as Christians, as part of the church in exile, in our youth, in our middle years, in our old age, on our bright days, our dark days, in our abundance, or in our need, in health, or in sickness, in fellowship, or in loneliness, in every place. This God, your God, says, but I haven't changed I am still who I am which is what I was yesterday and what I will be tomorrow and what I will be forever I'm the God of the covenant I'm your God and I'm with you and if he is who he is and he will be who he will be and he was what he was, then the God of today is still the God of mighty exodus power. And he's still the God of astonishing covenant love. His love hasn't grown cold over the years. It burns as, as fiercely, as ferociously in the heart of the God who always is what God always is. You know, just to have that promise, just to have this name would be wonderful, wouldn't it? It would be more than we could ever have deserved or expected. But God wanted to give more. He wanted to show more and more of I am who I am. And for 1,500 years, Israel would have read about I am in their Old Testament books. And they would have prayed to the Lord. They get to a point where they're, they're so scared of saying this name that it, it's why we don't actually know how it was pronounced because Israel wouldn't say it after a while. And they pop the vowels for Avonai onto the consonants Yahweh and they would always just say, Avonai means Lord. They would always just read Lord at this point. But they would have been talking about the Lord. They would have been reading about the Lord. They would have been praying to the Lord, I am. And then suddenly, 1,500 years later, a man stands up on this earth and says, I am, I am. He says, before Abraham was, I am. And the authorities, they wanted to stone him 
there and then because they understood the enormity of what that man was saying. He was saying he was the very one who was speaking to Moses from the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. He was, he is, I am who I am. And that was either the greatest act of blasphemy that this world has ever heard and the Jewish authorities were right to pick up stones in order to try to stone him. Or it was the very final act of the revelation of the name of God. What do you think? I know what Hebrews thinks. Long ago, that many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. Can you, can you actually believe that the God of Exodus 3 didn't just come down to see in theophany, but came down to save? in incarnation, that the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us to declare God to us in the fullest, final way. Can you now have ears to hear him speaking through John's gospel and saying, I, and the Greek is, I, I am the bread of life. Or if you want, I am, I am the bread of life. I'm the only one who can sustain you and who can satisfy you. I am, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. I'm God come to you to show you the way. I am, I am the good shepherd, the ever-present, ever-caring, all-loving Shepherd of the flock, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. I give life now that can't be extinguished, the life of God in your heart. But also I'll raise up life on the last day that will now be deathless. I am, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am not a saviour who brings about a temporary salvation like Moses. I am the Savior who brings us to a new name for God. If the Old Testament name for God was Lord Yahweh, the New Testament name is Father, Abba, Father. And you don't need a degree in Hebrew to understand that one, do you? That's what your God is revealing to you. That he is Father. And this is your God who comes to you through the pages of the Bible. Showing more and more of himself till you see everything in Jesus. And you come to this Father, Jesus says, through faith in the Son. It's a classic moment later on in John's gospel where Philip, hearing Jesus speaking, saying all these things, just almost dismisses Jesus and what he's saying and says, look, Jesus, show us the Father. And that'll be enough for us. What Philip's asking is to be taken back into Exodus chapter 3 and be given a burning bush experience. And Jesus says, oh, I've been with you so long, Philip, and you still don't know me. You still haven't seen. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only one who can bring you to the Father. What a way he goes to bring us to his Father. Because I am, I am Jesus, the Son of God. Doesn't lead us out of a physical nation. He deals with a spiritual state. And he takes our sins onto himself and he allows himself, the Son of God, to be nailed to a cross of shame and there pay to his Father everything that his people owe. It's the covenant, you see. 
God had promised. And though it costs the Father his Son, and though it costs the Son his life, he will deliver the covenant. And there will be salvation through the cross of our Savior. It's the greatest sign of love and of faithfulness that you could ever be given. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You take that by faith. Not take your shoes off like Moses had to in Exodus 3. You, you receive Jesus. Came all the way from heaven to reveal God to you. To die in your place. That he might lift you into the family of God. To talk face to face with Abba Father in heaven. And rejoice in this. That to us he is Jesus And it really is an extension of I am who I am. He's Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. He'll never stop being Jesus, the Jesus of the Gospels, who's so kind and compassionate and understanding and who looks after the little ones, brings sinners and written off people to himself is the same Jesus today. And he will be forever. You won't catch Jesus on a bad day. He is, I am who I am. And I am is our loving, faithful Lord Jesus Christ who calls us in all of our need and weakness and helplessness because he's able to save to the uttermost all who come to God through him. And he will bring us all home because he's the finisher. Not just the one who brings out. He has to complete his covenant because he is who he is which is what he was and what he always will be. Well, let's sing his praise in our last song, which is yet not I, but through Christ in me.
who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Well 